The international school and youth strikes for climate have been inspiring and shifted the debate on the climate emergency. Now there is a call from organisations and individuals including Greta Thunberg for workers to join the climate strike on the 27th of September 2019. Many of us would love to respond to that call from our younger sisters and brothers, our children and grandchildren, but few people in the UK have experience of going on strike, even fewer of political strikes like the recent strikes in Switzerland, Brazil or Sudan, and we are fearful of the consequences if we get it wrong, few of us can afford to lose our jobs. So what can workers do to take part in the climate strike, or at least show solidarity with it? I'm Ian Allinson. I've organised and led several strikes, including the first national strike in the IT industry, an industry with low unionisation and little tradition of militancy. I also stood in the Unite General Secretary election a couple of years ago, arguing for climate jobs rather than continuing to back environmentally destructive projects like HS2, airport expansion and nuclear power. This video isn't aimed to tell you what to do or to give you legal advice. It's aimed to explore some of the options and some of the barriers to taking part in the strike and help you make up your own mind what you can do. There is a compelling and urgent need for working class people to take action to avert climate catastrophe. Those in power are failing to act decisively. We know the rich and powerful will dump most of the impacts of their failures on us and try to make adaptations that benefit themselves at our expense. If we want a rapid and just transition, we need to act, not leave it to other people. Lots of people are talking about striking, but are we all clear what a strike is? Here's one definition of a strike. It contains a few essential parts. Firstly, it's a collective act. It's not an individual thing. It's powerful. It has the potential to create a crisis for those in power and it can be transformative for us. And I would argue that striking over climate is essential if we're going to break millions from the feeling of hopelessness and helplessness and the feeling that if you can't make a difference, you might as well ignore the problem and hope it goes away. Employers are rarely keen on strikes and workers are fearful of being disciplined or sacked. The primary protection comes from numbers, people sticking together. That takes work, talking to people, but it's work we need to do if we're going to stop catastrophic climate change. There are no shortcuts. There are some circumstances where the law gives some protection to strikers. We'll come back to that later. The climate strikes are international, very visible and over an issue that few deny is vital. If employers make threats, they're going to have to consider the consequences of carrying them out. The bigger the strike, the safer you are. There are three circumstances I can see where unions might call strikes over climate. The first is where a group of members has a valid strike ballot over some other issue, it might be pay or job losses or whatever, and decides to time the industrial action to coincide with the climate strike because they support it. The second is where a group of members has a valid strike ballot over some climate related issue that is in the jargon a trade dispute and I'm going to come back to what that is in a little bit more detail. And the third is where large numbers of workers are striking anyway and it becomes clear that the anti-union laws are unenforceable and the unions feel able to call the action. Even when unions won't call strikes we need to push them to call as much action as they can and be as supportive as possible of those who do take action there are a few examples mentioned on this slide. If you aren't in a union, it's important to join one. And there's a link there to a TUC website that helps you work out an appropriate union to join. There are also some non-TUC affiliated unions doing some great work. If you're a union member, you have the opportunity to meet up with other members uh, to argue and put forward motions for radical climate action. Within unions, it's quite effective to make a connection between the massacre of jobs that's been going on in recent months and the need to fight for good, sustainable climate jobs so that people have a secure future in good jobs. There's also a political argument to be made about the anti-union laws. In order to beat climate change, we're going to have to take action that the laws don't currently support. And that means we need to break them uh, at the moment and try to get them repealed. Labour's already committed to repealing the latest set of anti-union laws from the Tories, but even before they came in, the law was atrocious. 
This slide gives a little bit more detail about some of the policies passed by the UCU Universities Union and the Bakers Union. Uh, put those up there because they help give some ideas if you're trying to get policy passed through your own uh, union. It gives you some ideas of what's been passed elsewhere that you can maybe build on. I talked earlier about the three circumstances where unions are more likely to call members out for the climate strikes. Unless there's an existing lawful ballot over some other issue, I don't think major unions or the TUC are likely to call climate strikes in September. But nonetheless, a lot of people have been asking what the process would be for an official strike. I'm going to explain it so you can see why it shouldn't generally be our short term focus and how we prepare the ground for later. So the key concept here is the trade dispute and the law defines a really narrow list of things you're allowed to have a trade dispute about, which are basically things to do with your employment with your own employer. And uh, I've picked out three of the things from that list that are most likely to be able to be connected to climate change. And then uh, some examples of demands you might make of your employer, which might link to some of those uh, legitimate trade dispute issues. It's worth bearing in mind that, you know, on the one hand, use your imagination, try and come up with things that you could maybe include in a pay claim or a collective grievance or whatever uh, to try to get a trade dispute. But you need to be clear that in most cases, you're going to have to convince the union's own lawyers that it's a lawful trade dispute. So your imagination needs to be tested uh, with the union machine to make sure they're going to accept it's a trade dispute. So as I mentioned, the, the UK law, the way this is framed, doesn't allow strikes directly around climate change. This is a law that needs to be changed or broken. Even if you manage to get a legitimate trade dispute within the ridiculous legal framework, uh, getting a strike within the law takes ages. And the slide shows the different steps. So you're talking uh, at least a month and usually nearer two months between uh, being ready to go and being able to take any action. And then even if you do all of that, if the employer can persuade a court that they have an arguable case, in other words, they don't have to prove the case, just say they've got one to argue that the action would be unlawful. The court can issue an injunction against the union with potentially unlimited fines against the union. So you can see why uh, unions are very, very cautious about uh, calling action. And you can also see why it's unlikely that this is going to happen in many workplaces by September. Nonetheless, start creating the basis for trade disputes now by including climate demands in pay claims uh, and collective grievances in case it's useful later. Sadly, I don't think we'll have solved the climate crisis by October. So anything we do now to build up for the future is valuable. This slide describes the risks involved in striking outside the anti-union laws. For workers, the key risk is dismissal. For unions, this is injunctions and potentially unlimited fines. The safety of striking unofficially like this will vary hugely. At one extreme, if you work for an environmental NGO and all the workers support the strike, is your employer really going to trash their brand by disciplining you? Many public and private sector organisations claim green credentials, which would be seriously damaged if they started sacking climate strikers. At the other extreme, if few workers support the strike and your employer has no public profile and brutal employment practices, striking might be foolhardy if you want to keep your job. It's worth remembering that if you get sacked for striking over climate and the movement can't win you your job back, this isn't just a setback for you, but is likely to dent the confidence of others to join future climate strikes. Taking excessive risks isn't necessarily making sacrifices for the good of the movement. It can be damaging to the movement too, but no movement won anything without people taking some calculated risks. Before 1999, strikers could be sacked legally, but people still struck. Numbers have always been our main protection. A key thing to bear in mind is that what we're doing around the climate strikes is part of a process, not a one off event. The next youth climate strike is on Friday, the 21st of June, and it's a great opportunity to lay the groundwork in your workplace for what you can do in September. And then at the other end, whatever we do in September won't be enough to stop climate chaos. The fight will continue. 
So we need to be looking to do whatever we can, whenever we can, and seeing anything we achieve as building up for later actions, not as an all or nothing. If you can't get a strike in your workplace, that doesn't mean there's nothing you can do. We've already seen how the effects of climate chaos are shifting the debate, particularly when they're alongside action being taken by people. The political process can continue to accelerate along with climate change. The important thing is to start doing what you can now. For the 21st of June, we need to maximise the solidarity that we can deliver for the striking school and college students. And that helps us build up towards September. So some people, depending on shifts and breaks and so on, might be able to attend the pro protests themselves, build some connections. Even where we can't, people can take solidarity photos to post on social media, try and have lunchtime meetings or little rallies outside workplaces. The key thing is anything to get the discussion going with those people who agree with you. If you can't do that, you may still be able to get discussions going, just talking to one person or two people. That's a start. Where you do have union or workplace meetings because you've got some organisation, why not invite school climate strikers along to those? That will inspire people, get the discussion going. Parents of striking kids provide a useful connection between the school strikes and adults trying to catch up with them in our organising. A practical thing we can do to help the student strikes is to ensure there are no sanctions against those who take part. Edinburgh Council has set a good example authorising student absences where there's parental permission. There's some useful information on the NEU website about the rules around this and in many cases schools are doing far more than they need to to discourage kids from joining the strikes. So the facts matter. Where schools are academised obviously we need to take this up directly with the school and the governors or the academy chain uh, not via the council who have little control. It would be wonderful if school strikers demonstrated at certain workplaces where people were trying to get action or maybe even at union or TUC offices demanding action in September. Just as asking schools to commit to no sanctions against school strikers is a good idea, workers can ask management to commit upfront to no sanctions against climate strikers. It's a great move putting them on the spot. Sometimes it may come off. During the ambulance workers strike in 1989-90, the TUC called 15 minutes of action, not a strike, but in my own workplace, I wrote to our management and asked them to commit to no sanctions. Their reply was a little fudgy, but still helpful. And I photocopied it and stuck it on notice boards. That helped us get 250 people to walk out and march down to the ambulance station. Where if you, employers refuse to give this commitment, it exposes their greenwash and helps reveal who we have to fight to stop climate change. So it's useful either way if they say yes or if they say no. Where you have union recognition, members have a right to reasonable time off for official union activities. So another option if the union is backing the strikes but you can't actually get a strike is to see if members can get time off to take part under those rules. This would normally be unpaid, but would protect you from disciplinary action. Workers in particular workplaces need to start now discussing what they can do in September, however big or small. In Manchester, we've organised a meeting to get climate campaigners and trade unionists together to discuss what people can pull off. 